debate conducted by the Greater Burlington Partnerships Government Relations Committee. Thank you for joining us tonight. This event is being broadcast live this evening on KBUR, and we, have, we will have a media break sometime during the forum. My name is Brian Bross with Klingner & Associates, and I'm a member of the Government Relations Committee, and I will be your moderator this evening. Our timekeeper is Kyrie Duckett with the Greater Burlington Partnership. In the interest of time and fairness to the other candidates, I'm going to ask each candidate to observe Kyrie's signal and stop your response when the time's up. The forum will consist of rounds of questions and response times will vary by question. The order of response will be rotated so that each candidate has the opportunity to be the first to answer a question. A decision was made by the Government Relations Committee to have the candidates answer the questions impromptu so they have not seen the questions in advance. This is the second of two forums, and the additional candidates on the ballot participated in a similar forum Tuesday evening. This evening, the candidates have been placed on the stage in alphabetical order. John Billups, Cody Fleitner, Richard Goffner, Jeremy Hollenbeck, Chance Oliver. You messed this up two nights now. I say kind of <laughs> alphabetical. Sort of <laughs> alphabetical. Kathy John. Ryan Rogers and Jeff Stiver. Stivers. Very good. With that, we'll begin tonight's debate. And we'll start with you, John. This is a 90 second question. We'll go through the whole group here. But, John, you'll go first. As you introduce yourself tonight, please tell us why the why behind your candidacy. Hi, my name is John Billups. I'm a, a resident here in Burlington, Iowa. Uh, I guess the reason I, I decided to jump in is I've been involved in Burlington and several other fronts, several different committees, Steamboat Days, through some uh, city committees, uh, as well as uh, uh, in the chamber front. I've been on the Downtown Partners, the Chamber of Commerce Board, as well as Grow Greater Burlington. The only one I haven't nailed yet is the Convention and Tourism. But uh, I've thought for a long time about running for council. I think our city council is always a, a good board of men and women making, on the whole, great decisions. I think our city is a great little city. It is upsetting to me when people talk poorly about it. Yes, we have some issues. By the same token, we are the envy of a lot of larger communities, and I wanted to be a part of that. I think we have some, some interesting decisions coming up, and I have some... Uh, some business skills I think that might be able to help us uh, navigate through that. Thank you, John. And Cody, you can go next, and if you need me to refresh the question, I'll be happy to at any time. Uh, my name is Cody Fleetner. I would like to thank the Greater Burlington Partnership for having this forum tonight. Uh, big reason why I'm running, uh, I kind of put a feeler out there on my Facebook page, and the overwhelming response that I got from friends and family of the community was staggering. I uh, it, it instilled some trust in me that people believed in me, and I want to take that trust of the community and forge ahead with making, like John said, some difficult decisions and interesting decisions ahead, but I think we have the community in mind, which I feel I'm very networked in, um, that we can make great things happen here, which are already happening in Burlington, so we can just build upon that. Okay. Thank you, Cody. Richard. My name is Richard Goffner, and uh, I've been retired for a long time, and I've run out of anything to do. All the honeydew jobs are completed, and I just sat around home watching television and, uh, and get fat. So uh, I have lots of time. My, uh, my uh, campaign chairman is Dr. Rod Kellogg. He's been on this council for years, and he sort of pushed me into doing this because I do have time. It takes a lot of time. There's a lot of reading to do. There's a lot of meetings to attend, and I have plenty of time. I've been on the uh, Convention and Tourism Bureau in another life about in the early 90s for about 10 years. Uh, we were in the first group that went to Washington, D.C. to um, lobby for Burlington, and we ended up with a fire station out at the airport. And uh, if I go through all that stuff, you'll be bored to tears, so I'm just going to say thank you for having me. Thank you, Richard. Jeremy. Uh, hello, I'm Jeremy Hollenbeck. Um, I'm a Head Start teacher uh, for preschool, and what I, what I enjoy doing is helping kids in need. Um, the main reason I ran would probably be to kind of to give them a voice. Uh, there's a lot of poor people out there that really just don't have the voice. They don't have the money to throw out there. And they, their voices kind of go unheard. And uh, I'd like to be the kind of spokesperson for that. 
Okay, thank you, Jeremy. Chance. Well, my name is Chance Oliver. I'm 26 years old. I'm a customer service agent, ground security coordinator for Air Choice One at the airport. Uh, I grew up in Danville. Um, I've been living in Burlington for about a year and a half, but I've spent most of my working career here in Burlington. Um, and I've grown to love this city in that time. I've met a lot of great people and had a lot of really great experiences. Uh, but I know that there's a lot of challenges the city faces. Um, and I hear a lot of people around me talk about those challenges and complain about some of the, some of the negative aspects of Burlington. Uh, and I decided uh, to go ahead and run for city council because I'd, I'd like to step up and help uh, affect that change and make this a city uh, make it a great city that, that people want to move to and want to raise their families in because uh, there are a lot of wonderful things going on in Burlington and I think it's time that we build upon those and, and make it an even better community for all of us. Thank you. Thank you, Chance. Kathy? My name is Kathy John. I was born and raised here in Burlington. I have three children that I were born and raised in Burlington. Um, I have nine grandbabies and they are my grandbabies. They hate that, but... I work at Lowe's full-time, I work at Chaco part-time, and I work at Domino's part-time. I did 19 summers at the Bees Games, so people might know me there. I worked about 25 years at both Bolin, Rose Bolin and Roosevelt Lane, so people might know me from there. My simple fact I decided to run is because they gave the money to the mayor, and that's about it. People ask me if I have time. I have two degrees, I raise a family, and I work full time. So somewhere along the line, I'll find the time. I've had people stop me in the street to say, I'm so glad you're running. I had a guy stop me at the gas station yesterday and said, thanks for running. I don't know I'm from any, anyone. But you'll see me everywhere. So I think that I'm running for the working class people of Burlington. I think we need to have someone that gets up every morning and goes to work, just like every other person that does. That's all I have, thanks. Thank you, Kathy. Ryan? Um, yeah, my name's Ryan Rogers, and I'm, I'm basically running to be the voice for the average citizens of Burlington, Iowa. Um, I am someone who was born and raised here, uh, grew up in a single parent household with a uh, parent who made barely over minimum wage, so I know the struggles that a lot of people face growing up in our, the environment that we have. Um, Basically, so because of that, I have a good knowledge of the issues that face the working class, and I'd like to bring a different uh, approach and mindset into how we tackle our problems and provide proper growth for Burlington's future. Thank you, Ryan. Jeff? Okay, my name's Jeff Stivers. Uh, I'm customer service manager at Aaron Sales and Lease. A um, lot more people know me for the fact that I owned a cab company for about 25 years here in town. Um, the main reason I got into running for city council is the last year I've had some personal experiences that have uh, affected me a lot. I had a shooting right outside my kitchen window. Um, I've been was forced out of my house and had to live in a homeless shelter for a couple months. Um, I'd like to see those situations bettered so that we have better housing for people who rent. Um, I'd like to take a strong stance on improving the crime that we have in town. Um, I'd just like to see Burlington get back to the city at once when I first moved over here. And that's gonna take a lot of work and a lot of help from citizens of Burlington. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Our next question is 60 seconds. We're gonna start with Cody on this one. What is something about our community worthy of being promoted that doesn't seem to get much attention? I think um, one thing we could advertise and strengthen is our community get togethers and the things we have going, especially on the riverfront. I know uh, Friday Fest, Steamboat Days, um, Jefferson Street Farmers Market, our small business days, I think we could really build upon that and we could bring some outsiders into Burlington and show what we have and what we can offer in the future. I just actually had a friend of mine from Washington, Iowa. She came down for the Southeast Iowa Symphony uh, when they did the John Williams play and she's been talking up Burlington and Washington with how much it's grown from when she was here about 10 years ago to now. So if we could get some more of those uh, advocates to speak for for Burlington outside, I think we could shine on that there. Okay, thank you, 
Cody. Thank you. Richard? Well, there's a lot to choose from because um, I'm an old marketing man, been one for my entire life, and of course I don't see people doing the right kind of promotions for almost anything, but uh, we have, uh, you know, we went to the Playhouse the other night on Grove Street, that was a nice, I don't think anybody knows about that, uh, we are not enough people have said know about that, and we have um, uh, auditorium that apparently the people don't know enough about because we can't fill it up. And uh, we have a uh, park system that we should be leasing spots for RVs, which has been a hot setup for the last 20 years, and we've not taken advantage of that at all. And I could go on and on, but I think I'll stop there in the interest of time. Thank you, Richard. <laughs> Jeremy. I think I'd have to agree with uh, with Cody. Uh, we have a lot of good stuff going on downtown, and you really you just don't hear about it. Um, it might be in the paper or it might be on Facebook, but that's not really reaching everybody. And we need a we need a better way to promote those. Um, I'd say we we have a pretty bad promotion system in Burlington. Um, I when I go out and I look uh, to try to find activities to do with my kids and all that, and I I seem to have a lot of trouble trying to actually find them. Um, but no, I think downtown really, we've, we've got a lot of great stuff that goes on down there with the farmer markets and the riverfront and stuff. Okay, thank you, Jeremy. Chance. Uh, well, I'd, I'll agree with these guys. There's a lot of really great things going on in Burlington. We have fantastic festivals, uh, you know, Steamboat Days, the farmer's market and all that stuff. Um, I would say that downtown is something that needs to be promoted more because uh, there's already a lot of substantial growth taking place downtown and if we can continue to build upon that, uh, we can continue to build an even stronger community. Um, and I think also we need, to we need to work on promoting our youth a little more, getting them more involved in the community and I do think that's not just the school board's responsibility but also the council's. Uh, so if we get the kids out there, get them involved and excited about the community. Um, Promoting things is not going to be something that we're necessarily going to have to budget for because more people are going to know about it. So, thanks. Okay. Thank you, Chance. Kathy? I agree with Chance. I think we need to promote more things for the youth. I think that's going to be our future. We need to have something for them to do. Um, I think that if we give them something to do, they'll do it. I think if you have an opportunity to have fun, kids will do that. When I was at the ballpark and they would have a day for them to come to the ballpark it would fill up so if you give kids and especially young kids something to do that's what they'll participate in hey let's go do this did you hear so and so is doing they'll do that and i think that's what our future's got to be is investing in our youth and making them appreciate what we have to offer okay. thank you kathy ryan um, a lot of people are going to talk about like the downtown, the riverfront. Uh, those are both great. They have done great work. Uh, we have done great work as a community developing and increasing the downtown and the riverfront. I'd like to see us work more to bring more activities to parks. Uh, we are very park rich in Burlington, and I feel as though it's kind of an afterthought um, as to what we do. I mean, we could have uh, some sort of Halloween thing. People love Halloween, and they would donate their time for some sort of Halloween walk in one of our parks. Uh, basically, I'd like to see us uh, as a council try to promote more activities, more localized activities. Uh, as uh, echoing what Kathy said, um, kids will do stuff. So if we give them a um, more localized ability, we shouldn't have to force kids to go to Roosevelt or downtown to have activities to do. We can find these things. We can make these things happen. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan. Jeff? I think one of the biggest things we need to focus on is um, getting neighborhoods together more. Um, I, had, uh, I had a delivery that I did the other day and I was talking to the customer and uh, she lived in that house for almost 12 years and didn't know her neighbor's first name. So I think we ought to organize more neighborhood parties, get each neighborhood together so that uh, they can mingle and get, just learn to know each other. Okay. Thank you, Jeff. Could you give me the question one more time? Sure. What is something about our community worth, worthy of being promoted that doesn't seem to get much attention? For me, I think that's pretty simple. It's our people. Uh, we are a friendly community. Uh, community. 
as evidenced by the, my fellow candidates and the candidates on Tuesday night and the volunteers we have throughout Burlington. We are uh, volunteer rich and we are friendly rich. I mean, I, in my opinion, uh, we, we talk about our events and they're fantastic and we talk about some other things that we have going on. We are the envy of a lot of cities uh, up and down the river and, and throughout Iowa, big cities. But our, what makes that happen is our people. And we don't talk about the good people living in Burlington near enough, in my opinion. Thank you, John. With this next question, we'll start with Richard. It's a 90-second question. Facebook seems to be a platform for vigorous debate, yet many postings are emotionally charged and rampant with misinformation. How valuable is social media to you in terms of formulating your opinion? And as a member of council, how do you intend to use social media? Well, I, I'm not sure how I'm going to use social media. First things first, I've got to get elected, so I haven't really thought a lot about that. But uh, I do use Facebook. Uh, I run my entire campaign on Facebook. You can target it to individual people, and you, they will tell you how many people have actually looked at your, at your advertisement or your comments or whatever. And uh, being an old newspaper man and a prize-winning editorial writer, I just enjoy Facebook. I love to argue with people on there and stuff like that. I, I really enjoy it. So, so far, I haven't seen anything bad on Facebook. However, if you watch any TV, you'll note that it does get some bad stuff on there talking about even maybe the Russians were involved in our last election on Facebook and this and that and the other. So it's a necessary evil. Uh, there's some days I wish it wasn't there, and then some days I'm glad it's there. So uh, I'll live with Facebook. I enjoy it. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Jeremy. Uh, it's okay to get on social media and argue back and forth with someone for a little bit. Um, I don't think you should really get like emotionally charged into it and really just make someone mad. Um, well, you're, really, you're, you're trying to make each other see each other's side, not you know, blast one side and then they all of a sudden hate your side. Um, I, I don't think that's what social media should be for when it comes to politics and it shouldn't be in the news either, but it is, it's everywhere and now we've completely divided on the national level. But uh, social media for a council person I think should be used for a promotion of our city. Uh, we should be using it to promote the projects we're doing, uh, who we're working with, what we're working with, and things like that. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you, Jeremy. Chance. Could you repeat the question for me one more sure. time? Sure. Facebook seems to be a platform for vigorous debate, yet many postings are emotionally charged and rampant with misinformation. How valuable is social media to you in terms of formulating your opinion? And as a member of council, how do you intend to use social media? Okay, well, um, I do use social media currently to, to uh, find out a lot of the news that I do here on a daily basis on a national and world level, um, and even on the local level. Uh, but I don't really use Facebook to form my opinion because of the, you know, false narratives that go around on Facebook. Uh, so once I've found out some bit of information from Facebook, then I go on and do my research before I ever formulate my opinion. Uh, but as a council member, I would use Facebook, like Jeremy said, to promote the city, to make people aware of what the council's doing. Because uh, to this point, there's a lot of people aren't completely sure. A lot of people I've talked to aren't completely sure what the council does. Uh, they have a general idea, but don't know any of the works that, or any of the projects that are currently in works um, or any in the future. And so I would use Facebook to try and make sure that the, everybody who you know is able to see my Facebook. Uh, knows what we're doing, what the council's doing, what the city's up to, and where we're going. So, okay, thank you, Chance. Kathy, I would. I don't use Facebook for that. Um, I don't think it's a political. Mm, what do I want to say? It's politically correct to use Facebook for that. I think for the city and as council members, we should use Facebook so people know who we are. You probably couldn't get ten people to tell you who's on the council right now. If you ask them, they don't know. So if you promote the council as a member and, and say, okay, these are the members of the council, I think you should use it that. As for your platform, I don't, I don't use it for that. And I, I, because there's so much information out there and, oh, he said this and he said that. You, you have to talk to the person to know what they say face to face. I think you can tell a lot by 
when you're talking to a person what they mean and what they say and listen to them and not just listen hear what they have to say thank you Kathy Ryan well I feel as though Facebook is basically a tool to be able to reach people um, you know when it comes to information on Facebook and misinformation that people get um, I'm a firm believer of the uh, scientific method uh, I'm, I'm open to all information but you got to be able to prove it. It's got to be worthwhile evidence. It's got to be substantiated in some manner. So I tend to not believe everything that I read, basically is what I'm saying. Uh, you can have many good conversations uh, just using Facebook. You can get a good pulse on what people are thinking using Facebook. Uh, that's the point of having it is so that you can communicate with people. So I, I tend to use it and I would use it to help people be able to promote causes, um, ideas, um, just to generally talk to people. Try not to be too hot-headed when you're on Facebook because it's very easy to say things that will come back and bite you. Um, so that's really all I have to say. Thank you, Ryan. Jeff? I think, uh, I think Facebook is a great tool to use. Um, it's not something that's going to go away. Everybody has a Facebook account. My wife, she gets home from work She's on Facebook until 11, 12 o'clock at night. It's the quietest my house has ever been. <laughs> um, and I hope, she's, I hope she's not listening because I'll be sleeping on the couch tonight. But um, people got to realize that once you, uh, once you put something on Facebook or anything on the Internet, it's there. You can't take it back. It's not like a conversation where you can say, oh, I'm sorry. It's something that is out there and everybody's going to know. So getting into a personal debate or, you know, putting your views out there, the world's going to know. So you have to be careful what you say. But I, I think it's a great tool and it's something that we should use to put our views out there. Okay. Thank you, Jeff. John? Well, I think, uh, I think all social media is and can be a good thing, but it has to be used with discipline. Uh, I'm accused of being on it a lot by my wife, but by the same token, if her family is so large, I wouldn't have a clue what's going on unless I was on Facebook. Uh, my Facebook page is John Dudley Billups. I invite anybody, the public, to, to get on there and take a look. I'll be happy to have a discussion with you. But I do think there are instances where, as a council member, you have to abstain. And uh, we have to be pretty judicious about that on, on what we say and how we say it. We recently had a survey about uh, riverfront development. What, would, what is the general public like? Well, as much as we like to think we're connected with our, with our uh, citizens, that's going to be the easiest way to get a hold of us versus a phone call or, or, or being available. We're all working, we all have jobs, and, and from time to time, social media is the only way you can really get some ideas exchanged back and forth. But it does have to be used with, with a certain amount of discipline. Hey, thank you, John. Cody? Well, I work at Brad Dairy Honda, and I use Facebook day in and day out for my business use of reaching out to my clients and potential new clients. Um, I would treat it as such if I was on the council, using it for business and informational purposes for our community and for our city and for our council, just to inform everybody out there. Like John said, we all have lives. We're all crazy busy. That crazy I hear almost every time I talk to a client myself, oh, I'm so sorry I didn't get back to you. Life's been crazy, you know. So it's, it's a great, I think, tool we can use, but it can be abusive. And to formulate an opinion, you'd have to retract. You've got to you got to be professional, um, I feel, when you're on the council. But you also have to be uh, empathetic. I think you do definitely need to listen, like Kathy said, and um, don't, don't jump to conclusions um, because you don't have all the facts there yet. So everyone just needs to take a deep breath and just kind of step back. So thank you. Thank you, Cody. This next question, we'll start with Jeremy. Uh, it's 60 seconds. One of the difficult decisions, decisions you might have to make as a member of council is to either cut expenses or raise taxes. Which matters most to you, protecting <coughs> services or cutting taxes? Probably protecting services. Um, I think it depends on what we're cutting. Um, if we're cutting jobs, I may look more towards raising taxes. 
Um, you really don't want to see someone lose their job, especially if it'd be putting more strain on who's already working, if they're already overworked. Um, again, I think it really just comes down to what all is involved. Um, kind of hard to really just pinpoint what exactly I do, but that's about it. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Jeremy. Chance? I'd, I'd have to agree with Jeremy on that. You have to step back and look at the situation. It's hard to say not having a, a theoretical situation put in front of me what I would do in that situation. Um, but occasionally raising taxes is a necessary evil. It's obviously not the way we want to go. I and mean, nobody wants to have to pay higher taxes. Uh, but if it comes to cutting out a service that is a, a quality of life um, service for the city of Burlington, uh, if we diminish the quality of life in Burlington, uh, we're going to have a converse effect on what we want to do. We all are up here <clears throat> because we want to make this a better city. We want to make it a stronger city for all of us to live in. Uh, so if we start cutting out services that affect the quality of life for the people who already live here, why is anybody going to want to move here? Uh, so, it, you know, if I'm given the opportunity to look at a situation and decide, okay, I have to raise taxes to keep this quality of life service, that would be something I would be willing to do. Uh, but like Jeremy said, it all it's very dependent on the situation. Okay. Thank you, Chance. Kathy? I'm against raising taxes. I think that uh, we need to see what each situation is, but I'm very against, and I've had a lot of people tell me they don't want their taxes raised. The senior citizens, the working class people, they just can't afford any more tax on what they already pay. I think that we need to look and see where we can cut, and not just cut services, cut what we offer to people. Um, I know the number one complaint I've heard and I don't know as a city council if we can do anything about it, is the water bill. And I don't know the water company, I'm going to find out, because your water bill seems like it goes up every three months. And I know that we need new sewers, but somewhere along the line, the city has to be involved in that because it's a trash is on your water bill. That's city. So I think that you have to look at each service that you're offering and is there a way to do it better before you raise taxes? Thank you, Kathy. Ryan, uh, can I get you to repeat the question, please? Sure. One of the difficult decisions you might have to make as a member of council is to either cut expenses or raise taxes. Which matters most to you, protecting services or cutting taxes? Well, offhand, I would say first would be protecting services, but um, there is no one-stop answer. I mean, you have to be able to be flexible. At some points, you might need to look at cutting particular services. You might also have to look at very small tax increases. Um, I, would, I would definitely be opposed to tax increases whenever possible. Just because people in this town are struggling enough, we don't need to put more burden on them. Um, yeah. Uh, when it comes to quality of life type issues, we need to make sure we have the proper services available. We need to make sure our taxes are as low as possible. But, you know, it's a balancing act, and, and that's part of what we're going to have to do as city council members. Okay. Thank you, Ryan. Jeff? Well, one, one thing my father always used to say, that there was two things in life that are all certain, is paying taxes and dying. So, you know, it would be great to live in a perfect world where, you know, <laughs> You don't have to pay taxes, but they're a thing of life. And I don't want to see taxes raised, but I'd rather protect services. Um, they protect us from, you know, improve our quality of life. Um, one of the main things is, in the past, they've talked about cutting budget for the library. That is one thing I'm definitely against because I think the library is a vital service and we need to protect it. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. John? Well, you're asking some tough ones tonight. Uh, <laughs> actually, I'd prefer not to raise taxes and look at the expense <coughs> side of it. I, you know, everybody's expecting big, grandiose ideas from us, but I think sometimes it's the little things. You know, if you're in a budget crunch, can you go in and cut budget 1%? 1% adds up. Uh, can you be, you know, maybe this council will be the first council, not the first, but we reach across our border to our neighbors who have the similar problems and say, hey, why don't we get together and share this expense and lessen the tax burden on our, on our citizens? Uh, I think there's definitely could be some, some cost savings there in, 
in the expense side as far as equipment and personnel where we could provide more service for less cost. So I, I would be in favor of looking at the expense side first, but taxes are a necessary evil. Thank you, John. Cody? I'm going to pretty much echo what everybody else said here. Um, the quality of life is number one in my heart. Um, we got to look after our community. Uh, raising taxes obviously is never fun. Things like going to the dentist. Uh, nobody ever wants to go there and get your tooth pulled out. But, um, you know, with looking at the expense side of it, if we could find, like Mr. Billups said, more effective and efficient ways of how we're doing things now at a lower cost, you know, I, I have a great feeling out there that there's some great ideas out there that we're not even thinking of. And that's why we need to listen to our community around us. Okay, thank you, Cody. Thank you, Richard. Well, that's a loaded question, and uh, being a businessman all my life, I look at places like Memorial Auditorium, uh, millions of dollars invested, and it's open uh, 10 or 15 days a year. That's ridiculous. You can look at the park, and I just mentioned that uh, if they would have started putting uh, campers in a park 20 years ago when camping took over the nation, everybody was a camper, and charged them for it, we would have had $5 million in the city budget that we didn't have. But instead of doing that, dumped it on the taxpayers. We've got the um, recplex out there. They have tournaments. I think they have six a year. There's 20 weekends. If a businessman had that, he'd have 20 tournaments a weekend. It's a, a problem with operation. <coughs> I just, uh, it just make a businessman cringe when you see stuff like that. <laughs> There's plenty of ways to get it. Those uh, just raising taxes is not an answer for me. Okay. Thank you. We're going to ask a follow-up question, and we're going to start with Chance. Uh, 30 seconds. Uh, should you decide to cut a city service to balance the budget, this room may get filled with dozens of supporters of that program. With you, is it a case of squeaky wheel gets the grease where the loudest supporters get their way? Or are you comfortable upsetting dozens and perhaps hundreds of citizens with proposed budget cuts? I think in any government position, you have to be willing to upset people. You can't make everybody happy all of the time. Uh, and as a member of the council or any uh, official position, you have to be willing to look at the long-term results. Uh, so even though it may upset people in the short term, dozens or hundreds of people in the short term in the long term if we're able to cut the budget by large amounts because of it and it's something that is a non-essential service you know like i said you can't make everyone happy so okay kathy read it again i want to make okay. sure i understand yeah. should you decide to cut a city service to balance the budget this room may get filled with dozens of supporters of that program with you is it a case of squeaky wheel gets the grease where the loudest supporters get their way or are you comfortable upsetting dozens and perhaps hundreds of citizens with proposed budget cuts? You have to be able to, if you're going to take this position and you decide to run, you have to be able to make those tough decisions. The people that are in this room protesting things are saying, I don't want this or I don't want that. They don't know you. You can't take a personal. You cannot. It's a job you decided to take and you have to make that decision and you have to stand by your decision. So if I say, this is what I'm going to do, I want to have a reason why I'm going to do it. This is why I decided to do this. You can't take a personal. Okay. Thank you, Kathy. Ryan? Yeah, well, if you're running for this uh, position, you need to have a thick skin. Uh, you're going to make decisions that are going to make people angry at some point. Uh, it's, it's inevitable. So, you know, it's not the squeaky wheel getting the grease, but, you know, sometimes maybe that wheel does have a point, but more than likely, um, you know, based on the evidence that, uh, that I would have to make a decision that would be tough like that, I would be pretty, pretty resolute in it. And um, when it comes to a tough decision, you have to have all options and then be resolute in it. So, Thank you, Ryan. Jeff? I would have to agree with the consensus that, you know, taking this job, you are going to make people mad. I mean, that's just a fact of life. Um, you have to look at the bigger picture and see what's going to be saved or what's going to be vital um, to help the city become a better place to live. Okay, thank you, Jeff. John? Well, 
It, it is tough. I mean, I, my kids work for me. I work for my parents, and you've never seen frustration like a kid when he asks for a raise and parent says no. Uh, but it has to be a logical decision, not emotional. And so when people are fully invested in, in something like that, yeah, I think you have to listen to what they're saying, but then at the end of the day, we have to make the hard decision, and it has to be a logical decision, not necessarily emotional. Okay, thank you, John. Cody? Well, definitely be uncomfortable, obviously. Um, and you're going to have those moments, just like any job, uh, you're going to have ups and downs. Um, I was actually warned prior to running that, are you sure you know what you're getting yourself into? <laughs> <laughs> and I think working in the car business two and a half years, I've built up a good enough thick skin that um, I'm ready for it, and I, you know, like Mr. Billups said, illogical. You got to you got to look at the whole spectrum, and you make your best decisions and your interest and your your best foot forward. It may not appeal to everybody. Thank you, Richard. Well, I've had enough experience. It's not going to bother me a bit. I run a <laughs> newspaper. And the first 20 calls I got every Thursday morning was somebody belly aching about something. So you run a newspaper a little while and you find out you don't really have an ego because it's been beat out of you. <laughs> While your ego's been leaving, your skin has been getting thicker and thicker. So I've had so much experience in that. You have to take all the facts into consideration, make the best decision you can at that time, and you've got to live with it. That's just the way life is. Jeremy. <clears throat> Yeah, I mean, I agree with everybody here. I mean, we're looking for the community as a whole, not just a few loud, <clears throat> loud minority. Um, so if a service needs cut, that, that needs cut. And people are, got a few people in here yelling. You know, it's okay to make a few people mad to make a lot more people happy. Um, you know, my neighbor actually told me as well. <laughs> he said, you sure you want to be called all those names? <laughs> and I, say, I think I'm sure. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question is going to come from Rob Sussman at KBUR, and Kathy will receive that. <coughs> the riverfront is a major draw in Burlington. What do you see in the riverfront's future specifically regarding the auditorium and the port building? I think we need to keep the auditorium open. I think that it, it needs to be run by people that want to. Um, I think that it's a big draw. It can draw people to music festivals like Steamboat Days, or we can promote it for something else. I don't think it should be closed. The port has been used for lots of weddings and different things. So I think that we need to, that's what one of the things that we need to keep promoting as a city is that we have this facility available. And I think there's been two groups that have stepped up and said, let us run it. We can't shut it. I think that it costs more to shut it down than it would to keep it open. Ryan, um, I would like to see us have more entertainment options, if at all possible, in Burlington. So I do not support closing down the auditorium. I at least give it one more shot. Um, there, we can we can run this better than what than what the way it was ran. Um, I like what's going on with the um, the riverfront uh, as far as the, uh, the flood wall. That's going to help out a lot, and I'd like to see us develop a park down there to encourage more people to come downtown to spend time down there. I feel as though we need to have more activities in our in our area and I would like to see even more things develop downtown so people aren't just stuck going to a park or shopping or, or restaurants. There, there can be more things down there and anything that develops that I am for. Jeff. Well I think one of the the biggest things is that uh, we spend all that money on building up the port and building up the stage area there, but we only use it two, three, four times a year. I think that there's a lot of local bands and groups and activities that we could better use uh, that area for. Um, charge them a fee to have their, you know, band or, or party or whatever there, and uh, that would be extra income that we could put towards something else. So I think that's one of the biggest things, that we, we just need to use that area, and I'm all for keeping the auditorium open. We just need to find a way to uh, keep it full and add more days that it's actually being used. Okay, Jeff, thank you. 
John? Hey, I'm, I'm stoked about the riverfront development. Uh, I would go one step further. I would say auditorium port and the depot. Uh, the depot, uh, I would think, would be well served by being under that umbrella. I'm intrigued by the O'Neill and the Steamboat Days proposals. I think they both have some very good merit. Uh, to me, it is our number one asset that we can promote is that entire area. And, and quite honestly, if, I'm, if I get elected and if I'm on here long enough, I'd like to do the deep dive in the development down by the railroad area where BNSF has some space. Surely we can coexist with industry and, and have some more park space down there or, or even better private development. So I, I, think, I think we're on the we're on the edge of what we could be down there on the riverfront. We're peering over the, the, the cliff and saying, boy, there's some exciting times coming. Okay, Cody. Well, we are a riverfront town, so we have to have a great riverfront. And like everybody has said here, uh, we just need to show the whys of the reasoning that we need to invest on the riverfront, especially the auditorium and the Port of Burlington. I've been to many weddings down there, many events at the auditorium. To Ryan's point, I feel it's how you run it and who's supporting it, because there's some people out there that can take advantage of situations, especially when money's involved. So I think you get the right team in there and the right promotion, and it's just gonna explode. I'd also like to extend, I know you said the, uh, the depot, but I'd like to include our boaters in Burlington. Um, right now, I know it's kind of a mess because of the flood wall, but once that gets developed, I'd like to get boaters involved, have you know more dock options, more parking for our boaters, more conveniences of getting in and out, because right now it's just a mess. And I know that from my mom and dad. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Cody. Richard. Well, you've hit upon a question that I'm torn between two evils. The first one is I would like to see the auditorium get up and rolling again. There's surely got to be an operator somewhere in this world that can put, uh, put that thing back up on its feet. On the other hand, I have been to a few tourist traps in my day, and uh, you could sell that land, put a six-story high-rise in there with the um, porch opening over the Mississippi River. I've seen... Uh, Stayed in many of them where you went to the porch and it opened onto another high rise right behind you. So, uh, at, put that on the tax rolls. They'd be paying a lot of tax, and it would be a great uh, asset for Burlington. So, I don't know which way to go. I'm I'm open for that. Thank you, Richard. Jeremy. Um, you know, I, I really like the auditorium, and I think it'd be a great place if we could actually find the right person. Um, Right now we're struggling to do that, and I think we have found somebody else too, so I guess we'll see how that goes. Um, and that, I mean, the riverfront's great. Uh, it'd be a great tourist attraction if we can really build it up and get more acts in. Uh, it'd be a lot of be able to do a lot of stuff like outdoors, like Steamboat Days, and have more outdoorsy, doorsy acts. Um, it'd be a really great place. The boats on the, on the river watching, and just great. <laughs> Thank you, Jeremy. Chance. I would say that I, I do feel that the uh, the entire riverfront, the port, the auditorium, the depot are all assets to our community. It's an important part of us being a river community. Uh, and they, that comes back to that quality of life thing. Uh, it's a big part of the quality of life in Burlington. And if we lose the auditorium or the port of Burlington or the railroad depot, those are all quality of life losses uh, that we don't want to see happen for this city. Uh, that'll, that could easily slip us into a regression and, and continue to continue to exacerbate the issues we already have in Burlington uh, by not having these quality of life things. Uh, so I would be open to seeing, uh, I would love to see more acts in. Uh, I would love to see if there is somebody who can privately operate the auditorium while maintaining that, that uh, quality of life asset that it is. Uh, and if we can't find somebody to do that, I think it's time that the city step up and make sure that we're running it properly then. Thank you, Chance. All right, our next question is a 30-second question. We're going to start with Ryan. Many candidates for office have a pet project. What is yours? <laughs> uh, well, my pet project is actually more uh, poverty alleviation. Um, I know that a lot of the things that people have heard about my press have been uh, more green energy related, but I feel as though that would be a tool to help fight uh, poverty and put money into the average Burlington's pockets. So the, the main thing that I want to see is more people have more income. I think if we do that, we will vastly increase our town and make it so people are able to buy houses and everything that we need. And I know that's time. Thank you, Ryan. Jeff? Well, 
I technically have two, but the, the biggest one that I have is uh, we have a paint-a-thon that we do every year. Um, I'd like to see that expanded into uh, helping people maintain their yards. Um, I've been around Burlington driving a cab for 25 years, and um, I've seen a lot of yards that are in disarray. Okay, thank you, Jeff. John? Well, that's a tough one. I don't really think I have a pet project, uh, with the exception of the project's probably going to end up being the budget. Uh, I think every year we're going to have to work hard on that. Uh, and in that regard, I would think that looking at that budget, seeing where we can discover, like we do in the private sector, the efficiencies that we could realize, uh, I think that's going to be the main thing for me. Thank you, John. Thanks. Cody? Um, for me, um, just recently taking over Big River Popcorn would be um, the expansion of small business. Uh, America was founded on small business itself. I think the growth that we have downtown now is great and I just want to keep adding to it. I would like to also invest and bring in the youth because that's our next generation that's going to take care of Burlington. I'd like to maybe touch base on the incubator project that I believe that the chambers of the city had at one time uh, to get more people as an open door for that route um, for their future. Okay. Thank you. Richard. Well, my pet project I took on about a year ago when I decided to do this job is to paint the cotton pick and fire hydrants. They look terrible. They're so bad, they've got scum on them and they've swelled up. But it's, it's just a disaster. So if I could get somebody to paint those fire hydrants, I'll be the happiest pig in the, <coughs> in the puddle, let me tell you. Thank you. Jeremy. A uh, pet project for me would probably be trying to build a stronger community. Um, we need to, I think we need a better job at advertising and bringing the community together when we hold events, um, like downtown. Uh, a lot of people don't go, a lot of people don't know, and if we were able to advertise it, we might be able to get to know our <laughs> more outward neighbors. Um, and I think that's, that's mainly mine right there. Thank you. Jan uh, Chance. Uh, if I had to choose one, I've got, I don't have enough fingers and toes to count the things I'd love to see done. But uh, if I had to choose one, I would say my biggest one is getting the council more directly involved with the school district. Uh, I've said before and I'll say again that I think that uh, building a strong school district is the foundation of building a strong community. Uh, and I think that it's time for that the council get directly involved in, in with the district, working along with the school board and find out what, what sort of tools they need to try and help improve the district. Okay. Kathy. I don't think I have a pet project. I think that I want to work with the council and making things happen for Burlington. I think that to make things happen for everyone <coughs> and to make people want to stay here and want to live here. Okay. Thank you. And with that, we're going to take a five minute break. So gather your thoughts and we'll be back. <laughs> Taking all the notes you need already have. I'm not taking any notes. I probably should. No, I only meant the, the names. Oh yeah, I'm good. Yeah, I'm good. Is it clear enough back there? You're clear. Okay, good. You're loud. All right.
I'm um, with the Government Relations Committee. Yeah, at the chamber. Yeah, I'm Brian Brian Bross with Klingner and Associates. Yeah. Nice to meet you. I think I've seen you around. Yeah, we're engineers. Yeah. Probably you betcha. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for coming out tonight. If you have any complaints, just talk to Kyrie here. <laughs> Or one of these thick skin guys. They were all agreed that they were they were they were, they were gonna make somebody angry. <laughs> That's good. Huh? It's kind of warm in here. I know. I brought my jacket because I didn't know if it'd be cold or not. So, and, and now I'm hot, <laughs> and I'm not normally hot. So. Get back into this. Our next question is a 30 second question. We'll start with Jeff. Sometimes the outcome from the decisions you'll have to make it as a council member will take some time to be able to evaluate. Knowing what we know today, was the decision to create the Burlington Crossing development a good idea or a bad idea? I think it was a good idea. Um, I'm not 100% familiar with this, but uh, some of the decisions that the council have made in the last six months to a year have been good decisions. Some of them have been bad. Okay. We'll go into John. That's, that's a tough one because we can't change the past. I, I wasn't a big fan of how they implemented that. I don't think we should ever take people's homes uh, in that regard. That being said, we've waited and uh, thankfully we have some, some people that have stepped up and we will realize a, a good return on our investment there eventually as we get these buildings in there. So. Okay, Cody. I'm not too familiar with that. Um, I haven't heard anything <clears throat> bad from the people that I have talked with um, regarding it. So I would agree that it was a good decision, just a little longer than what it took, but a good decision indeed. Okay. Richard. Yeah, I feel the same way. It took too long to get that rolling, but it's, it's gonna be a fantastic uh, addition. And uh, I think the hospital's got a building that should have 
started a couple of months ago from Walgreens south to the pizza place, and it'll be a, a quick care center that will have, uh, I understand, x-ray and uh, lab work due in there. So that's going to solve a need for this uh, community. Jeremy. <clears throat> yeah, I have to agree. I mean, it was a good decision. Uh, it did take a long time, but it's really starting to come into fruition now, and it's looking real good. Okay. Chance. I would agree with John. I'm not necessarily the biggest fan of the way it was executed. Displacing people might not have been the best option for that. Uh, but the long-term results, I will agree, have been a pretty positive return on it. Obviously, economic, the economic downturn uh, kind of staggered the results a little bit and made them much longer-term results than what we expected initially. But in the long term, they, it has turned out pretty good. Kathy. I disagree. I think it was a bad decision. I live by there. I think that the only thing that it's brought in is um, jobs of pay minimum wage. I don't think you're making the money that you lost on that. I don't think you made the money back. I think it was a bad decision. I live by there. I voiced, I went to the meetings and voted against it and said, no, it's not going to work. And it was a long time before we got anything. And we haven't gotten really any uh, a return on our investment. Okay. Ryan. Um, I actually got to agree with Kathy. I don't <coughs> like that we lost low-income housing in this town. I feel as though there is not enough. There, there's a good amount of affordable housing, but we need to have enough affordable housing to be able to give people a proper leg to stand on. Uh, the businesses that have come in are not going to be high wage, haven't been high wage, um, high enough wage, and Burlington does not need more minimum wage jobs. But on the other hand, we have to live with it, and the best thing to do is to try to develop it the best we can. Okay. Our next question, we're going to start with John, and we have a question from Tanner Cole at the Hawkeye. The Burlington Police Department's acting policy is to never release police body camera footage to the public. The Hawkeye and Autumn Steele's family have been trying to make public any footage of Steele shooting for over two years now. In a case like the shooting that occurred in Burlington on Sunday, Many municipalities around the country would have already released footage for public review. What do you think Burlington's policy should be on releasing police car dash camera footage or body camera footage when Burlington police shoot someone? Well, as a private citizen, I wish they would. But if you're sitting here on the city council, I think you have a responsibility to protect the city of Burlington, too, from uh, possible lawsuits and, rep and repercussions. That being said, uh, two years is too long. Uh, two years, they've had plenty of time to, to look at that, uh, they've had plenty of time to investigate it, and they should release that footage. Now, in the case of the, the last uh, shooting, unfortunately, we've had in our community, uh, no, you shouldn't release it if it, it would impede or alter an investigation. That's my opinion. Cody. Yeah, I'd have to agree. Um, until all the facts are set and everything's out of the smoke um, I don't feel those should be released to the public but in the sense of the two-year mark way too long um, yeah that's all I have to say about that Richard well I'm not an attorney but but I believe if you have uh, something like that happen and it's a personal injury I think there's a time expiration when you can file a civil lawsuit and I think it's two years if there's a fatality involved there is no time limit you can be sued as long as you live so uh, I think that uh, wow I worked hard to get that uh, <laughs> public access for newspapers and uh, radio stations, TV stations back in the 60s and 70s, long, long hours to get a sunshine law passed. And so I'm torn a little bit about that. I still think that everything should be done in public. But on the other hand, I think financially are probably better off to hold. They, they release some of it, and that's probably what they've been doing. This is not the only place that's happening. There's several cases like this pending around the state of Iowa, and uh, one of these days, one of them is going to finally get to the Supreme Court, and we'll know what's going on, but right now, it's a, it's a guess. Jeremy. <clears throat> yeah, I believe that uh, <clears throat> videos, dash cams, and all that should be released to the public. Um, I believe we should, we should be able to know what's going on and what happened as well. Um, it may be best to wait until after the investigation um, before releasing it. Um, probably best to at least talk to families before releasing it and uh, you know if most families are usually okay um, 
Some of them will not, but I, I believe it should be public record. Thank you, Jeremy. Chance. Uh, once the investigations have concluded, I think absolute and complete police transparency is the only way we're going to reinstill public trust in law enforcement because uh, there's a lot of a stigma out there right now that uh, many law enforcement agencies can't be trusted. Um, and by not releasing that type of evidence, you know, dash cam, body cam footage, uh, that just solidifies that public mistrust in law enforcement. So the only way we're going to start um, creating a stronger community police relationship is by being completely transparent. Thank you. Kathy. I agree with those guys. I think that you have to release it. I, I appreciate that the Hawkeye went after that because I think as an average Joe citizen, they wouldn't have been able to afford it. I, I think the Hawkeye was right in that. I think Autumn Steele's family is right in that going after that. It's been way too long. As for releasing it, I think once your investigation is done and it should be it shouldn't take that long to, to say, okay, he did this. It sh people need to know. If you're going to trust the police, and that's what you want as a city council and to back your police department, it's trust. And right now they don't. Ryan? Um, I'd actually, uh, I'm all for transparency when at all possible. Uh, so I would like to see maybe a civilian review board um, help v review any videotape evidence. Uh, that may happen. So that way we know that it's going to be uh, not damaging to the public to see this and also the people. You know, we've got to rebuild, we've got to build trust between our police community and our community itself. So if at all possible, I do want um, the, the footage from not only the Autumn Steel incident, but this most recent one, uh, Marquise Jones, uh, his uh, information should be out there. Um, I, I do not like it when uh, this kind of thing happens, and I'd like to see it happen less often. So, Jeff. Well, I thought the, uh, the whole idea of getting body cams was to protect both the officer and the victims involved. Um, I feel that uh, the footage should be released. There are so many rumors out there going today about both of these shootings, that uh, if the footage was made public, it would bring it to light and show that, you know, neither one of these officers may have done wrong, or if they did do wrong, you know, it would give the, you know, families of the victims some closure. Um, it's, it's hard to for both sides to, you know, be in that kind of a situation. And I think once, you know, once the footage is released, it'll give closure to both sides. Thank you, Jeff. We'll take the next question to Cody. 90 seconds. <coughs> Housing is a topic spurring much debate. Should the city be in the business of financially supporting housing? And if so, how? I see why you gave me 90 seconds. <laughs> um, I, uh, I feel maybe the city could be a support system of helping people in need of finding affordable housing. Um, I haven't done much research yet, but I'm willing to um, in regards to what programs we can uh, utilize here in our city. Um, I know right now, uh, I think it's uh, Charlie Nichols. Um, he's uh, introduced the Renaissance Project from another town and kind of beautifying uh, Burlington itself there. Uh, I've been through other communities too where uh, they, they have found the low, low cost housing to be a benefit and it kind of just puts that passion and instillness into the community that this is a great place to live and they are going to stick around. So um, I, I would say at least be a support system, kind of a person that, or we can be a person that they can come to. Uh, for that kind of help so thank you Cody Richard well I have kind of a three-pronged answer the first one is that I've been watching this for about a year and friends of mine who have people that uh, purchase a house if they're young people with children why they always purchase it outside of the community because they're scared to death of the crime problem here and then when the older people they want to invest I know a few people that want to invest a million bucks to build a house, they're scared to death of the way their Burlington is letting itself go when they get to retirement age in 25 years, why it'll be a junk pile and they have no way of getting rid of it. 
Neither one of those categories ever said the taxes are too high. So I'm a little bit concerned about that. So I, I don't know the answer. Um, what I do know is that, that uh, housing and the TIFs and all that is one big ball. And if you want to get in the game, you have to run with it. If you don't want to get in the game, you don't have to, but you're not going to be competitive with your neighbors. It's, it's a businessman's nightmare because you're either competitive or you're not, and they have to make up their mind which way they're going to jump. Thank you. Jeremy? I agree with Cody. I think we should be more of a support system, um, and especially to help the, the low income find housing and have affordable housing in Burlington. Uh, so we should be helping uh, developers to create low, uh, low income housing. Uh, we should be supporting them, giving incentives, stuff like that. Thank you. <coughs> Chance. Well, I'd say that uh, part of a uh, smart growth economic strategy is supporting your, the workforce in your community. And the economic state of Burlington right now, a lot of the workforce is lower income. Uh, so part of supporting the workforce is going to be ensuring affordable housing. Uh, and whether that be through inclusionary zoning laws or implementing TIF funding uh, to assist with that or an even more direct role, it's definitely something the city needs to be a part of and ensure is happening. Um, because I know a lot of people who are living three, four, or five people to one house uh, simply because they can't afford rent without it. Um, rent is starting to slide down a little bit, but it's, it's definitely something the city has to be involved in, is ensuring that the workforce that currently exists here and any workforce that we'd like to attract in has affordable housing to come to. Thank you. Kathy? I agree with both of those guys. I think that you have to have affordable housing to attract businesses. I think that the people, if, if you want people to stay, you have to have affordable housing. I think what the, when the Weaver plant came and people threw houses together and, and built all these and drew this big money, it's no longer there. Um, at the Burlington Crossing, those businesses that are going up, they're paying minimum wage. So that's not affordable for people. You can't afford on a minimum wage and raise a family. So I think as a city, we need to support whoever's going to, to rehab houses. I think that that's a big deal. It's working with the school system like they're doing and rehabbing a house for somebody to afford to be able to purchase that house. I think once you purchase a house, you take pride in your community because and your yard and your because you're living there. You want your neighbors to say, "That's a good neighbor." Look at how they do their. I think that that's what you need. Thank you, Kathy. Ryan. Well, to echo a little bit of what these guys said, uh, there's a big reason why I'm running, and that is because uh, I, there's a United Way Alice study that uh, shows that. About 24% of Burlington uh, in 2014 was under uh, the poverty guidelines. Uh, a further about 20% or so was uh, considered under their Alice constraints, that's asset limited, income constrained, employed, basically working poor. So that's 44% of our population that's struggling. Uh, we need to have uh, good affordable housing for these people. Uh, we need to make it so that uh, we increase help for like our Bridges Out of Poverty programs where we help people be able to build their credit to be able to um, purchase houses. We need to keep the people that we have here and we need, be, need to be able to make sure that they're able to stay. Um, you know, a lot of people leave Burlington because of lock, lack of good job opportunities and not able to take advantage of the fact that frankly we have some of the least expensive housing to buy uh, around anywhere. So we need to make it so people can take advantage of that, grow our tax base. Uh, one other thing I'd like to talk on is um, our TIF policy. Uh, we should make sure that we have a standardized TIF policy. For right now, it seems like a grab bag where everybody's trying to you know, ask for funds and for this project or that. And instead of saying, uh, having them ask, they need to know, this is what I plan on doing. This is how I have to make it work. This is how I'm going to get the TIF financing. So thank you. Thank you, Ryan. Jeff? I think I have to uh, agree with uh, what, if, what everybody is saying is uh, one of the biggest things, and this has been my personal opinion, I've lived in Burlington for 30 years and all that time I've rented. And I've had some good landlords and I've had some bad landlords. And uh, I, think, I think there ought to be some policy where we need to hold our landlords responsible and uh, you know, liable for keeping up and maintaining their houses 
there's a lot of people that come to Burlington and and they'll buy up houses because houses are cheap here and you can purchase a house and turn around and rent it out for seven, eight, nine hundred dollars with just doing minimal work on it. Um, I think the biggest thing we need to concentrate on is improving our city inspections. City inspectors only inspect houses once every five years and a lot can happen in five years. Um, I lived in a place uh, a couple years ago that uh, um, barely had a working bathroom. But, you know, you're expected to pay rent every month. But when it comes to fixing, the landlord's never there. Thank you, Jeff. John? Well, I think it's about supply and demand. You know, affordable housing... Um, Housing becomes more affordable when there's more of it. Burlington has a, a housing shortage right now. I, I think that the TIF, we have a TIF policy. It should be strengthened, but I think you can use TIF when it provides infrastructure or infill or redevelopment of a blighted area. Uh, as far as single homeowners, I think we have a, a pretty good tax abatement policy, but maybe we should expand that to encourage some more uh, single homes being built, uh, infill there as well. As when you build those homes, typically the American dream is the person sells the home they're in and they, they move up. And so that makes other homes av available. I think the more homes we have, uh, the better off we are. We have a problem exposed during the fertilizer plant expansion. Not enough housing. And so all of a sudden the landlords are driving the rent, rent up as the market is wont to do. If we have more housing, that, that rent would have stayed the same. I do agree there should be an inspection each and every time before a landlord rents a property, and that might encourage the landlord to vet their client a little bit more and encourage long-term rentals versus having an overnight or a quick rental, uh, which seems to destroy neighborhoods. Thank you. This next question uh, will go to Richard. Uh, it's 90 seconds. Economic development and job creation is a tough business. How do you intend to encourage economic development in Burlington? Well, I've been a member of the chamber for a number of years, and uh, I, along with other people, was instrumental in getting the business park put together from the Caterpillar Tractor Company, and uh, that was a long project, a difficult project. The uh, figuring out where the streets were, because the boundaries didn't run on the streets between Burlington and West Burlington. I think it took us about two years before we could even get it platted and put together. Then you have this horrible uh, uh, marketing problem of trying to find somebody to move into it. And uh, you uh, get uh, from these uh, companies, uh, if you make a call, they send you back then, it was in the early 90s, about an eight page questionnaire. Do you have a golf course? Do you have a swimming pool? <laughs> Do you have this? Do you have that? Because the companies that want to build here have such things as employees, and they want their employees to be happy. They don't want to build something in a place where they're going to be unhappy. So I've filled out many of those sheets, and I just wished a lot of times we had more things to put on there. But of course, the taxpayers don't quite see it that way. They want less on there, so their taxes will go down. So. It's a, it's a nice quandary to be in, but um, uh, finding uh, uh, businesses now depends a lot on the state. Uh, they, they have people that run all over the world uh, trying to scare up, and that's how we got Silgan, by the way. All right. Jeremy? Uh, <clears throat> I think we need to advertise Burlington better. Um, we've got great parks. Uh, we've got a great downtown. We've got the Snake Alley. We've got a lot of great things about Burlington, but you know, a lot of people don't hear anything. You know, they hear we've got a bad crime problem, um, which we should be addressing. Um, our schools are a little lower than they should be, and that's something we should be addressing because good schools bring people in. Um, there's a lot of little things we could be addressing uh, to keep working on the economic development of Burlington. Thanks. Chance. Again, that's uh, something that the uh, smart growth economic strategy would address. Uh, we're, 
increasing, uh, strengthening the school district is a big part of it. Uh, we already have a lot of the quality of life uh, aspects that you need for a community to have economic growth. And now if we can focus on areas that already are experiencing growth, like downtown, um, and uh, you know, focus intensely on those, whether it be through uh, funding, you know, providing additional funding for entrepreneurs, uh, refocusing TIF money, in ways that would support business growth in, in areas that already are experiencing some growth. Um, and then also looking at areas that have the potential for growth that are largely ignored. I couldn't necessarily tell you what areas those would be, but I'm sure we have those in Burlington. I know there are areas that, that have that potential for economic growth, but are largely ignored just because of their location. Um, so these are all things that, there's a lot of pieces to, the, to an economic growth puzzle. Uh, whether it be schools, quality of life, uh, and then actual direct support of businesses and the workers. So, Thank you, Chance. Kathy? I think you need to work with the Greater Partnership more, I think, that, um, and West Burlington. We can promote both. I think if we have more advertisement dollars from both Burlington and West Burlington, and we're working more to combine our services and say, hey, we, we partner with these guys. We do this, we do that. I think you have to have good businesses that want to come here, but not just to pay minimum wage. I think that it has to be a business that's going to allow people and their employees to be happy. Thank you, Kathy. Brian? Well, growing, higher, um, growing business in Burlington is going to take, um, unfortunately, a little bit of tax massaging. Because the, the reality in America is today that you have to, uh, for higher wage businesses, you're going to have to bribe them a little bit. That's just the way it goes, unfortunately. Um, so the Burlington Partnership, I would definitely work with them, uh, take into consideration what they have to say. Um, you know, we need to work to have a 21st century infrastructure. For example, Apple did not move to uh, Ankeny, or wherever that was, I'm sorry. Uh, Waukee, Waukee. Uh, they moved to, they, want, they looked at that area because of the green energy that was there. They looked at it because of the, um, they looked at it because of the fiber optic infrastructure that they had. It wasn't just, you know, where can I get the best deal. Uh, like Goffner, uh, Mr. Goffner said, uh, we need to look at entertainment uh, ways to keep employees happy while they're not at work, uh, and employees and their family. Um, <coughs> Small business, we need to invest in our small businesses. I got a buddy uh, who mentioned that Hollers was uh, up for sale, and he doesn't have the capital to turn it into his idea of what he would like to see develop there. So uh, we need to work on our small business. We need to do what we can to try to get as many high-wage jobs into Burlington as possible, and I'd like to try to do that. Thank you, Ryan. Jeff? I think one of the biggest things we need to do is make Burlington more appealing for new business. Um, right now, when new companies look at Burlington, they say, well, look at the crime rate. Uh, look at uh, the housing situation. Um, is this the type of town that I want, you know, my employees to live in? So I, I, think, I think there's a lot of work that needs to be done first before we uh, focus on getting new business. Um, one of the biggest things that I'd like to see happen is uh, we focus so much on the companies that we do have. Um, we, uh, we've relied on Case Company, GE, Champion for years. Um, I was really happy when Silicon came in and I'd like to see more companies like that. Um, but like I said, we have to make Burlington appealing. Um, one of the biggest things we need to do is uh, advertise more, you know. There's a lot of people out there that, uh, that uh, don't even know what Burlington's about. We have some of the greatest people here Thank you, Jeff. John? Well, I think the city council um, needs to be the inspiration of economic development, although I would leave it to the professionals of the chamber. I think does an absolutely incredible job in Grow Greater Burlington. The partnership is designed for economic development. We need to work hand in hand uh, with them to continue to grow our city. And what, 
there are times when the city needs to get out of the way. Uh, I have several friends that were in developments downtown and because of miscommunication between the departments, uh, they invested money they shouldn't have. And so we need to do a better job. Uh, the council needs to direct Jim Furneaux to, to, and empower the department heads to make better communications in our department so when a person has a project, they're making the most efficient use of their money. Uh, the TESCA plan was developed in 1985. I'm showing how old I am. And that TESCA long-range planning is something we cannot ignore in Burlington. The TESCA plan said that you will eventually lose shops downtown, but it will be replaced with bars, niche retailers, uh, restaurants, and service activities. And what do we have so many years later? And so you, you have to work the, develop a plan and work the plan. And that plan will change, but you have to have the plan to start with. Thank you, John. Cody? Well, I have to applaud a Greater Burlington Partnership for what they've done um, downtown. Um, me being a business owner downtown myself, uh, I think we're number one in economical growth on the Mississippi River, which is amazing. Uh, I, I feel we need to build upon that, and as the council and the city, we need to support that. Um, another big thing would be the infrastructure. Um, it does create jobs and attracts and retains a skilled workforce, and the infrastructure we build today is the legacy we leave for, to, for future generations to carry on and go forth and build upon that. Thank you, Cody. We have one last question before a closing statement, so we'll go ahead. Uh, Jeremy, we'll start with you. 30 seconds. It's a quick one. So finally, as a member of the council, when is it okay for you to micromanage city staff? <clears throat> um, I'm not sure if it's really <laughs> our, our job to do that. Um, I think that's more the the manager he should be checking in on city staff and I guess if it comes down to it and he needs our opinion then we could give that to him but I don't think we should be out there micromanaging people thank you chance I'd have to agree with Jeremy uh, it's important to give uh, mr. Furneaux the tools that he needs to manage the city city property but it's not the council's place to step in and uh, uh, micromanage the actual city staff uh, unfortunately for Jim, I think he's the only one that I think the, it's okay for the council to micromanage, so. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Kathy. I agree, but I think that sometimes you have to um, maybe bring things to Mr. Ferno's attention that, that someone has brought to your attention. I don't want a citizen to say to me, I couldn't get uh, Mr. Ferno on the phone or I couldn't get anybody to answer the phone. Can you just bring this to this attention? I don't want to ignore any citizen that brings me a complaint or says, you know, I couldn't. I want them to say, I appreciate that you, you brought this to the, to the city manager's attention. Thank you. I, Thank you, Kevin. Ryan. Um, I feel as though we pay the city staff so we don't have to micromanage. Uh, that's, that's kind of a point of delegating uh, responsibility. Um, and then from there, we have to trust the city manager that his employees are doing the good, a good job. And if at all possible, come up with ideas uh, to help move that along if needed. But it's their job. Uh, they're not paying me to do the city staffing job. So thank you, Ryan. Jeff. I don't think we need to uh, micromanage the city staff. But <coughs> on the other hand, I think that we should hold them accountable. If, if, you know, if something that they're doing is not uh, up to the standards that uh, we hold and we should, uh, we should make them, you know, responsible and accountable. Okay. Thank you. John? Micromanaging. I've been a manager since I was 20 years old. I've been guilty of it and it's never effective. Uh, we have a chain of command. We, we need to follow that. Uh, and, and, and also enforce that. However, I do think a citizen has a right to call any government official at any point in time and have voice concerns about their government they're paying for. Okay. Cody? I think Jim does an outstanding job and just kind of get out of his way and let him keep doing what he's doing. A uh, big part of a relationship, um, whether it be with your significant other or with the council and their city manager is communication. As long as you have the open communication, I don't see micromanagement ever being an issue to be brought up. Okay. Richard. 
Well, I think it's on the front page of the financial statement that they put out here in Burlington. It's more or less a job description of what the city manager does and what we as council people can and can't do. So I think that's already carved in stone and micromanaging is not in there. I can guarantee you that. <laughs> Thank you, Richard. All right, our uh, closing statement then, each candidate will now have 90 seconds to offer a closing statement. Uh, so we'll go with Chance. All right, well, first off, thank you to the partnership for hosting this. It's been great. Uh, I'm excited to see how many people are running for council. That's obvious how many people are passionate about uh, creating a better city for all of us. Um, I hope that I can be a part of that. I have, a, like I said, I have a ton of ideas and things that I'd like to see done. I take my time, I do my research. Uh, I don't like to go into a situation not knowing what I'm getting into. Uh, so I, I'm not the kind of person who's going to make a, a rash decision or knee-jerk reaction uh, without any evidence. Uh, so I hope that the voters can see that uh, I pride myself in being well-informed. Um, I pride myself in loving this city, and I look forward for the, to the opportunity to help build a stronger Burlington with everybody's help. Thank you, Chance. Kathy? I do want to thank you guys for inviting us and having this forum. I think it gives an opportunity to the public to see what you stand for and what you look like. I'm running because I want to make a better place for my kids and my grandkids. I want it to be like for when I was a kid. I think that you have to remember that it's not personal, that I make a decision based on the facts that I find out, that I want to know that it's true. And I will never take anything personal because people don't really know who I am or what I'm about. I'd like to thank everyone that stopped me in the street or stopped me at one of my jobs and said, thanks for running. I think that it's made me feel really good that I made this decision. And I'll find the time. All right, thank you. Brian? Well, I'd like to thank everyone uh, for being here, holding this forum. Um, the main reason that I'm running is that I am planning on, uh, you know, building a family here in Burlington. I'm buying a house. I'm a homeowner, and I want to have a community that I can be proud of. I, I've lived here most of my life, and I want to live here for most of my life. Uh, I have no grand aspirations. I just want to have a good, solid community to live in. Um, I want to see us at, uh, invest properly for the future. In, in my opinions, I want to see us grow the businesses that we need for Burlington, and I'd like to see us fight crime in the ways that we need to. You know, we just need to make sure that we have a good community to live in, and I feel as though I would be a good choice to help with that. So thank you. Thank you, Ryan. Jeff. First off, I'd like to thank the partnership for hosting us tonight, and I'd like to thank the rest of the candidates up here. I think any one of these candidates up here would make a great councilman. Uh, one of the main reasons I got decided to run is I'm not an experienced guy. I, I don't know a lot about uh, the city council and how it is actually run, but I do know people. And um, owning a cab company for 25 years, um, they're like a bartender. They get in the car and they tell you stories. And they tell you things that are good about Burlington. They tell you things that are bad about Burlington. Uh, we pick up a lot of people at the airport. And they tell us, you know, the good things that are happening in Burlington. I like this street. I like your park system. Um, you've, got, you've got great down front, you know, downtown area. And I want to keep that going. I want to make Burlington a great place to live and a proud place to raise a family. Thank you, Jeff. John? You know, when I announced <coughs> I was going to run, one of my smart aleck friends said, you know, make Burlington great again. And, you know, <laughs> talk about throwing, throwing a brief stuff to the wind. Um, <laughs> but I, my response was genuine then, and it is now. Uh, secret is Burlington's already great. You know, I, and I have benefited from living in this community for years, and I would love to give back more than I have. Uh, I know, Brian, you've been involved in, in on various ends, uh, different cat community involvement. I would like to serve as a city council. I think any one of these candidates uh, would do a good service as far as city council or the candidates on Tuesday night. Uh, I hope that all of us 
regardless who wins, stay involved on in working to make this community a better place, and, and including the, the people watching and the people showing up here. I would like to thank uh, the Chamber, uh, BPW for the earlier forum, and also the media for the coverage that we've been given. Um, now is the time for people to hit the polls. This is a crucial time for Burlington. So regardless who you vote for, vote October 10th and vote no November 7th, and I'd be honored if you chose to vote for me. Thanks. Thank you, John. Cody. Well, I first want to thank the Greater Burlington Partnership, everyone who showed up, and everybody watching tonight. Um, you know, I, I've had some critics say that I lack substance, but I feel where I lack substance, I make up with passion. Um, I did move away from Burlington, and it only took me less than a year to move back to realize what great community we have here and what we have. It's one of those things you don't know what you've got till it's gone situations there. Um, I'm going to repeat myself when I had my interview with Rob, but I am here of the people, for the people, and by the people. I will take the trust that you instill in me and voice for our community, our diversity, our youth, young growth for survival. Let's turn from spectators into participants. We have too much to do to sit on the sidelines. We need to step out of the dark and into the bright light so that we can see the dawn of a new day. We need to teach our younger generation how to put civics into action where we live. We need to cultivate our future leaders, our future generation directly. Each individual person with the power of their ballot has the ability to influence the community around them. In case you forgot, I'm Cody Fleetner, a new hope for Burlington. May the vote be with you. <laughs> Thank you, Cody. Thank you. Richard. Well, I'm going to use my time to answer a question you didn't ask about the Cascade Bridge. There's a group in town that have applied for a grant to replace Cascade Bridge. They're not connected with the city in any way. Uh, they tell me that they think it's going to go through, and it's what's called a participation grant. And uh, that means that the community will have to put up some money as well as the grant money that they're going to uh, bestow upon us. Now, I am using no facts, but just for uh, argument's sake, let's say that it's 30%. That means the city will have to come up with $1.8 million if... I am right in saying, once again, we have no facts. This is going to be about a $6 million project. That's for what I think. So uh, the taxpayers will say, oh, my God, we're going to have to get taxed for that $1.8 million. And I say, well, that's better than the $6 million. So um, uh, from a businessman's standpoint, you know, I'd take the $4.2 $4 million in a minute and grab it and see if we can get that bridge put back in, in circulation. I hear about it all the time. I think it's been about 15 years. When it was originally uh, condemned, the uh, engineer that condemned it said that it is possible it would collapse under its own weight, so they didn't want anything on it or under it. But of course, the councils decided that that's, that's okay if we do have something on it and under it. So I want to get that done, and uh, I too uh, thank the uh, chamber and uh, everyone associated with this uh, pleasant evening on television. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Jeremy, we'll end with you. All right. Uh, thanks for hosting this. Uh, I'd like to thank all the other candidates for coming out as well. Um, Burlington is great, and um, I'd like to really get in there and help continue making it great. Um, we've got a lot of good things going on. Uh, we've got some not so good things going on that I feel where I've looked into and I've researched. I feel like I can, I can put my opinion in there and and bring a little bit of something on the outside rather than just throwing something out of, you know, putting a Band-Aid on a problem. Um, I'd like to help continue to make our community stronger. I feel that's important for a city. Um, and, uh, I lost my train of thought there. Um, <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Jeremy. It happens now. All right. Long night. <laughs> well, I want to thank each, each of you for your interest in serving the Burlington community. I want to thank the Greater Burlington Partnership and its Government Relations Committee for hosting this event. And, and I want to thank those in attendance at the audience here tonight and those who have been watching or listening at home for your interest in the City Council election. Please vote for the candidates of your choice next Tuesday, October 10th. With that, good night. Thank you.